Upon its release, Inherent Vice was met with mixed critical reception. Some people called it great, and others called it a jumbled mess. And yet, they are both right. This movie first appears to not make a lick of sense. We follow a drug-fueled private eye trying to do a small job for his ex, before without any warning he quickly gets wrapped up in corruption, drug dealers, neo-Nazis, and this. Ultimately, this is a movie about change. We follow Doc as he talks from person to person trying to figure out exactly what is happening, all the while consuming copious amounts of mind-altering drugs, making us question how much of this is he actually hallucinating and how much of this is real. In order to help make the story flow better, we have a narrator, but the narrator herself brings up some trouble. She takes the form of a person who isn't actually real. But once we get past that mess, most people tend to look at the narrative, and that's where most people get caught up. But really, this film isn't about the story, it's about Doc, and his relationship with all these different characters. So let's try and figure out what this movie is about, starting off with its title. Inherent Vice originated as a law term, and refers to the incident in which something causes damage to itself, like a house falling in on itself, or chocolate melting. At first, this may appear to refer to Doc, him stumbling around trying to solve the case, getting knocked out, beaten up, and put through a series of nonsense. But in the end, he solves everything. He figures out who's behind the solve, and he does everything he sought out to do, and succeeded while everyone else failed. In all reality, inherent vice refers to the change from the 1960s to the 70s. To this, we are going to have to look at the author of the book that this film is based on, Thomas Pynchon, who is known for writing incoherent stories that usually reflect the hippie lifestyle. In this film, we see the stark contrast of the easygoing 60s where everything seemed to work, to the harsh capitalistic 70s where problems began to arise everywhere. Regardless of where you stand politically or economically, that's what the novel and the film say. I, for one, am definitely pro-capitalism, but I love how this film shows this transition, and I love how subtle it is. Capitalism is present in the character of Michael Wolfman, who is a businessman and real estate agent who, quite frankly, sells crap to anyone willing to buy it. And best of all, a view of the Dominguez flood control channel that can only be described in two words. Right on. He begins to regret this morally, so he fakes his kidnapping and joins a cult. This is an attempt for him to go back to simpler times. But that is really the tip of the iceberg. The Golden Fang is a big part of this movie. It's constantly brought up, but never really answered, and it's a whole lot of things. It's a boat, it's a group of drug dealers, and it's a syndicate of dentists. It's everywhere. And throughout the film, Doc tries to figure out what it means, and eventually he does. However, what it represents is capitalism, and how it's sinking its teeth into every part of society, both the underground drug level and the legal business side. So let's assume that that's what the Golden Fang represents, and look at what this means. Dr. Rudy says that the Syndicate of Dentists was formed for tax reasons. This shows that capitalism fuels capitalism. They formed the group to try and avoid taxes, but in doing so, they strengthen the heart of capitalism. Shasta is kidnapped by the Golden Fang and is on the boat, and upon her return, she seems to be on the straight and narrow. Tonight, she was all in flatland gear. Yet, Doc is able to return her to her former self by the end of the film. This also shows that capitalism has taken control of all of society. The drug gang that calls themselves the Golden Fang sells heroin to people, which rots out their teeth. So they go to the dentist syndicate, also called the Golden Fang, to get it fixed. This shows that there is a perpetual loop, and once you get sucked in, it's very hard to get out. However, Doc was someone who never got in. Let's talk about Doc, because he's a very interesting character. As I mentioned earlier, this is a movie about change, yet one of the only characters who does not undergo any change is Doc. He is someone who ends his journey at almost the same place where it began. The first shot in the film is very similar to one of the last ones. He is still living at the same place and doing the same thing. His life isn't different because society has changed, and that is why Doc is a perfect hero. He has morals and sticks with them. Regardless of what you think about these morals, they are still there. He has a set of rules that guides his life, and really isn't interested in the rules that guide the United States. Let's go back to the first scene in which he takes the case for Shasta, and he does this because it's the right thing to do. Not because Shasta has enough money to pay him, and not because there's any real chance of them getting back together, but it's the right thing to do. He has a very rich history with Shasta, and he feels like he owes her that much. From there, everything he does is to do what's right. He decides to help Hope find Koi because it's the right thing to do. As our narrator points out, Doc may not be a do-gooder, but he's done good. At his core, he always does what is right, and because that's the way he lives his life. 
he isn't taken seriously by the LAPD, yet in the end, it is Bigfoot who breaks the law, and it is Doc who follows it. Bigfoot steals heroin from the Golden Fang, and Doc questions his morals. The purple elephant in this film is the story, and I feel like I wouldn't be doing it justice if I didn't talk about the way that this story is set up. When people talk about this film, the biggest problem most of them would have is that the story is simply too hard to follow. And rightfully so, it's all over the place. It's extremely hard to follow. And when you look at a mystery movie, you're inclined to try and figure out exactly what happened before the characters in the movie do. But in this case, Doc stumbles upon the solution to the mystery, and while trying to solve it, he gets wrapped up in a much bigger one. It's impossible to figure out what is going to happen. Yeah, this is the movie that isn't about story, but instead is about characters. Next time you watch this movie, just watch it and watch the characters. This is a comedy, albeit a dark comedy, but nonetheless a comedy. It is there to make you laugh, and a lot of people get so wrapped up in the story that they don't get to appreciate the humor of this movie. A lot of people expected to see another There Will Be Blood, or any of the other great films by Paul Thomas Anderson, and when they watch this movie, it ends up being completely different. But completely different doesn't equate to bad, and this is not a bad movie. It's a very unique one. So those are my thoughts on Inherent Vice. It was so much fun revisiting this movie and watching it again. I'd love to have a conversation in the comments below because I barely scraped the surface of this movie and what makes it so great. There are going to be a whole lot of different opinions about this movie and I'd love to have a conversation. Make sure to join me next Saturday when we look at Fargo. Someone requested that video and I love filling requests. Until then, check out my last video when we looked at the film Shame. There's a link to that on the left of the screen and the link to the Fargo one on the right. Thanks for watching. Whoa,